Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. So it's pretty late tonight. I'm a little tired, but uh, as I've told you guys many, many times about the book I read regarding fatigue, that when you stay up late, they've discovered that the left brain part of your brain will go to sleep and your right brain will take over. And so a lot of creative things can happen at night. I guess why creative people might stay up. They just starve out that logic and they create reality, right? Reality is what this show is going to be about. It's going to get a Matrix name. You know, it's interesting. When I started this show, and what, almost nine years ago now, I was doing a lot of episodes on the Matrix over the last nine years. You know, recently I've been getting into movies, television shows that predict things. And there's a very interesting thing that just kind of dawned on me, really today. And it has to do with, you know, uh, ancient history where man did his best to describe what was going on. You know, like all the uh, the ancient Egyptian, was it a, the god Anut? You know, she is the blue sky with all the stars on her body. And at night, you could only see the stars on her belly. There's the old European description of what Earth is. It's on the back of a turtle. Of course, religions have created tons of firmaments and flat earths and all the kinds of stuff. And we understand. We understand they didn't have the ability to travel up in the sky. And even the ground travel was very limited. And so they did their best. The Native Americans, at least in one tribe in America, said that all the stars were essentially the souls of those who had departed. I think that's beautiful. And we, we through our sheer hubris, we believe that we have eclipsed that era and that we're accurate now. And what a joke we're telling ourselves. In this century, we are going to eclipse creating realities. It's only the first quarter of this century. We're about to complete it next year. Okay. So what's going to happen in the next 25 years after that? I mean, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with the earth. And I think that even if a lot of us get squashed off this planet, there's some uh, bizarre plan they've got. Those who are going to continue, or those who have the technology are going to continue to perfect this stuff. So what I want to take us through today is an exercise in how are we lying to ourselves today potentially about what's about to come and how man is going to perceive anything. How do we capture reality today? I mean, how do we do it? There's the best form of capturing reality so far, which is to use your human body, the most complex machine that we know that exists. We have more mute moving parts and pieces in the human body than the universe has to hold itself together. The universe is very simple. It's almost algorithmically nauseatingly simple. But we know it's a fractal, you know, as it is above, so too is it below. The fractal generates up the same shapes as it generates down. But in the middle of this, we have a lot of life forms on this particular plane of existence. And then us, but how do we capture it so that we can look back and say, oh, that's what was. There's Grandma. There's a uh, Plymouth Fury. How do, we, how do we do it? Well, we have our memories. We could uh, take a picture. The picture's capturing light through a series of lenses. Goes on the emulsion of film. Burns, chemicals, we develop the chemicals in the opposite direction, we start getting negatives, then we start exposing negatives back down to a, a polar opposite, so we get colors, and we have a photograph, started out black and white, of course. And of course, if you look through history, they actually captured pictures of things, maybe even back several hundred years before the camera existed, using various chemicals and painting them on wood and then using a pinhole and long exposures. 
Okay. But we're trusting the empirical reality of that process, right? Light from the real world is bouncing into this mechanism and we're burning a copy of it. Just ask the people of Pompeii how to take a picture. We have beings that were turned to ash. And that's a picture. In fact, it's a three-dimensional picture of a real human being. Someone standing somewhere and they get flashed because some giant cloud of energy comes up and we have the imprint of their body like in Hiroshima, Nagasaki. I don't think that's the first time it's ever taken place. It may not be due to the same device, but we've got all kinds of weird burn marks over the world. Very strange. You know, quartz, boiled quartz and the Egypts and, and all through Africa. But how do we do it today? Today we have a lens. It's in a cell phone. It's in a really nice digital camera, a camcorder. And that's going through and it's hitting a little pad of sensors. But then that sensors goes into a piece of software that's going to grab all the grid data and write it to a disk of some sort, memory, SSD, and then we take it to various software and view it, right? But then there's something called Meta, which is trying to get kids to, say, screw reality, put on some glasses, see the world. The glasses are going to see the world. The glasses are hooked to the internet. The internet does all kinds of big machine learning, uh, object recognition, and then starts replacing things that you see with what they want you to see. Right? You can go to Disneyland and maybe it's, whoa, you can dial in uh, Disneyland 1955, you know, and you can see it however you want to see it. Okay. Well, I think that it's probably safe to say that we're probably entering the next five years where companies are going to start changing your photographs on you if they haven't already. A gentleman came out, for instance, and said that he was paid $60 million to insert chemtrails into old movies so that you would think this stuff goes back a really long way. Hmm. Now, I can tell you right now, one of the reasons why we know these things didn't exist in the early 90s and before in any major way, okay, there's reports of them going back to the 70s, but it's very strategic and very limited, was that Hollywood now has a budget to race these things out of the sky. You could film Spartacus in 1959 and not have to take them out of the sky because they didn't exist. So Rome didn't look like it had jets in the sky. However, today, if you bit torrent down old movies, they're in there every once in a while. Not, not a lot, but just in a couple scenes, and they're very faint in the background. Let me ask you. Now that you've seen Dolly create unbelievable images out of nothing and several different services that do it, and the Sora thing that's coming where it creates animations that you cannot tell the difference between reality and what this computer created, and Sora is using 3D models and not big machine learning models, which is more mathematical models. Imagine you took a photo uh, of like 1955. It's your grandmother and grandfather standing in front of a fountain. And you upload it to eh, one of these operating systems, which, remember what I told you nine years ago, the purpose of an operating system is a spy software architecture, okay? Connected to the internet, nothing is sacred, nothing. Yeah, you think you have a Fourth Amendment, and you think you, they have to create a warrant. They don't, and they never have. They've never honored those laws. So just keep telling yourself you're protected. Keep looking the other way when they pass things like the Military Commissions Act, which is basically forcing mobile companies to spy on people. And they get paid for it, so they don't mind. But that old photo of Grandma and Grandpa, even if it's sitting on your hard drive somewhere, they could walk in with AI, no human being has to do anything, and slowly transform every single photograph looking for the sky. Well, we know now that these AIs, you, what you can do with ChatGPT 4.0 is insane. I was doing some architecture, just to give you an example before we finish off this other idea. I was trying to figure out, because the designer came back and said, I don't think you have the sidewalk wide enough, because we got to put some stuff on the sidewalk. And she was right, because I didn't even try to get it right. 
But then I was looking at the photographs through Google Maps, and I was like, oh, I wonder how big that is. There's a car parked there. And so I uploaded the photograph to ChatGPT 4.0. I said, you see the two slabs of concrete? Can you tell me approximately how wide those things are? And it came up with this giant measurement of 12 foot segments. I was like, whoa, that seems like way too much. And so I said, well, let's just do it. So I did 12 foot segments. God damn it, it matched the photograph perfectly. <laughs> yeah, it's already there, okay? So it can look in your photograph and find the sky, even if it's a black and white photograph. And it can do whatever it wants. Rewriting history live. You take a photograph at the beach, but you're not paying attention to the sky. It just inserts them. It inserts them in your Apple Cloud, your OneDrive Cloud, Dropbox Cloud. They all get a little kickback for doing it. Could be built into the phone. Well, I wasn't really paying attention. I, I don't look up at all, right? I don't think I've covered the movie Brainstorm. I'm going to cover it. I have talked about Brainstorm as if I'm covering it, but it's very, very cliff notes. We're going to actually create an episode about Brainstorm. Because in this episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brainstorm. Very, very just matter of fact about the technology that's in this movie. Released, I believe, in 1983. It's like 81 to 83, somewhere in there. Maybe it's 82. And Arthur C. Clarke's 3000 won A Space Odyssey. A book he published just before he died. You see, Elon Musk your fake hero, is experimenting with putting chips in people's brains, right? Some guy just volunteered to have it in there. What you need to understand about brain chip technology is that at a minimum, if they can't get you to accept a, brain in, or accept a chip on your brain inside your skull cap, they have to put it on the outside of your head to at least do what we call output sensory. So you're having all these thoughts and the output, you know, little milliamps of brain voltage is going out your skull cap. And boy, is it through a skull cap, it's very, very mild. So that's them being able to observe potentially what you're about to do physically. If they put on your visual cortex, who knows what they could actually assimilate off the visual cortex. You see a lot of things online about them reading your memories or reading your thoughts and that kind of stuff. Well... If you've ever been to an electronics show or a gaming convention show, stuff is faked all the time. But the chip that goes under your skull is like the old chip experiment they did in the 70s where they put it inside of a bowl. And they had a matador dude, you know, with his red thing. And here comes this bowl, man. Boom, 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 boom. And they just go, Nr! and that bowl just goes, uh, 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 you know, and it doesn't hit the guy because it's in the middle of like a basic electronic stroke. It's just absolutely inhumane for the bull but we eat them whatever we're not supposed to torture them but just remember that whole thing where scientists just don't care when they get to one level they're like well of course we killed the child we needed to know the information of what kills child you know it's like it happens it's been happening forever you get to that in a little routine in every accent and you'd be correct but they want to get a chip underneath your skull because that's the input mechanism that will actually start controlling what you're doing, not just sensing what you're about to do. I know a lot of you know this already, but in case you're new to that whole thing and how they're accomplishing this, anything that you do, a smile, me moving my hands like I'm moving on the video, a thought I'm having, a good thought, a benign thought, melancholy, whatever, angry, they take computers and they Cover your head with a net that's going to capture as much electricity as possible in this output sensory, right? And they just ask the subject, what are you feeling? Just be super honest. And of course, the scientists have plenty of subjects. I'm feeling really angry right now. And they'll smack you in the face. How'd that feel? And they'll watch how all this stuff outputs it in your brain. They'll make you move every single finger, every single little tiny phalange, every little joint, your everything. They'll get you sexually aroused, whatever. The entire time this is happening, that data set, which could be small, which could be millions of little points on the top of your head, is, is outputting into a computer. And they're teaching the computer this sequence of numbers relates to 
this emotion. It relates to this body movement. Learn. Put it through a neural net with the goal to learn. With their little Q outputs. So once they've taught it something, it becomes increasingly easier and easier to start understanding what the human being is about to do. There's a guy who is a quadriplegic. I just watched a video today. He's had the Musk chip put in his head. I believe it's the Musk one. And he is now looking at the screen and he's typing things. He's actually thinking of words. It's very early in the process. It's very screwed up. And what you need to understand, Ross Perot taught us something. Ross Perot made a bunch of money in the late, well, in the mid-80s Ford because he was trying to convert all the paper documentation of the world by scanning it, having it optical character recognition, all of the letters, and then build that into a digital document that then could be stored. Brilliant idea. But he said, he said in an interview once, you know, when they first started doing it, the error rates were huge. And so they would have it scanned. Then uh, a human being would have to check it. And he said that, he goes, even 5%, even 2% cost him millions of dollars in lost profit. So ask anybody who's building a quantum computer what 1% to 2% error rate looks like. It renders the computer pretty useless without human intervention to figure, figure it out what the problems are. Of course, they're trying to use AI and big machine learning to correct that 2%, but it's only a prediction of what should be there. It will still be wrong from time to time. Now, I, I'm pretty sure we've got document scanning down pat at this point. We'll just rescan it again and again and again until they get it right. But what was my point when I started the show? We are so certain that we're no longer filling ourselves full of crap that we got it all right today. Look at all this technology we have. Come on. We could be bull chat GPT. Okay. We are about to eclipse in this century, unless there's an absolute holocaust where it gets rid of all the technology, even from those who have it, who are like, you know, the elite of the world kind of folks. I shouldn't call them that because they don't deserve that. We're the elite of the world. But if things go as normal, then by 2050, you're going to see reality, real time, generated by AIs. You will not be able to, probably, by 2050, know the difference between something that is completely synthetic and something that is actually real, which means your ability as a human being to find out the truth of any one moment in history, unless you were actually there, would be very difficult. But imagine that you sort the phones and all camera devices, and you're trying to capture Oh, man, here's the UFO. Here's something happening in Haiti. And it's just rewriting the history live. Those people didn't die. This thing isn't happening. The streets are clear. Oh, my gosh, there's women dressed in beautiful clothing and everyone's smiling, but you're filming a Holocaust. It'd be like filming Fallout video game and everything's perfect again. You know, like before the bombs happened, right? Yeah. Take that. 2050. And it's happened. There's even a bottle of champagne broken on a super quantum computer with a thousand stable qubits, which means reality is done. That's enough processing power to conceive of more. If, even if the universe doesn't exist the way we've thought it to exist, or these, these scientists say, but let's say it was as big as we say it is, it can conceive of damn near infinity at that point. Every single ethereal particle in the universe can be conceived of with a thousand stable qubits. We may never accomplish that, but (laughs) I think we will. But now man has, uh, through innovation, figured out how to completely simulate reality to the exact specification of the reality that we currently live in. What is that going to do to mankind, right? Right. What's the cover story for not reporting aliens from the government? Well, it would create mass hysteria among the religious religious people. What was funny about that today is we know that's not the case because they are trying to crush religion absolute. 
Every country in the world is trying to get rid of their own religion. Unless you provide a jihadist vehicle to destroy the first world countries, to collapse the entire planet, that religion can continue. But Christianity's got to go. Judaism, well, it's not a big problem, right? They don't, necess- they don't believe in hell, so hey, do whatever you got to do. Have a synagogue in Brooklyn. It's basically a little murder den underneath. Doesn't matter. I think those are definitely very eclectic small group of folks, but you got crazy Christians, you got crazy Muslims, you got crazy everybody. There's always one little group that's doing something nuts, right? Can't blame the rest of the world for that. But then we go back to that old Douglas Adams question. What's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? We know the answer is 42, but what's the question? But what is man going to think about man's reality when we eclipse reality? I mentioned Brainstorm and I mentioned 3001 A Space Odyssey. Let's go into why I mentioned those two, two pieces of fiction. If you haven't seen Brainstorm, it's Natalie Wood's last movie. And it's Christopher Walken's, one of his opuses. It's just great. It's a great movie. In Brainstorm, what they did was they created a contraption that wraps the skull and essentially records all your vital signs, meaning how you feel from the tip of your toe to the top of your head. It records it, but it records all five senses that we are willing to acknowledge in this idiotic world of ours, meaning we have way more than that, but you know, whatever, that's good enough to convince most of us of what's going on. So if you wear this contraption and you record, in the movie they have this really thick tape, which actually makes sense because of the billions of pieces of data that need to be recorded per second, right? Of course, we don't use tapes anymore. We use cables and digital technology. One thing about hard-coded medium is that you don't have to transmit the data and potentially lose some of it. If you can just grab it off the the sensors and put it into a tape, might be interesting to see that come back for that particular technology for a short bit anyway. But with that film, there's a, there's a funny scene in the film, which won't necessarily be that important when I give you the breakdown of the film, but there's a scene where there was a guy in a laboratory who was kind of the douche. And he's kind of good looking and he's, he's uh, just banging everybody in the lab that was young and there was this young girl and he put the thing on off hours and recorded himself having sex with this assistant. And then he orgasmed. And then he sold that tape to an old man. I mean, he didn't sell it, but he gave it to an old man in the lab who went home and just thought, oh, what's this? He puts it on. And he sits in his, uh, his little den and he has the full experience of being young again and orgasming. So the genius takes the piece of tape and creates about a 12 to 14 inch loop and splices it together (laughs) with the orgasm in there. And he sits there just boom, boom, like he's just jolting into the chair. And his wife gets nervous because she doesn't know what he's doing. And I hate to see his pants. And Christopher Walken comes over and sees him and this loops, (laughs) his fucking tape's going in a loop and the guy's just jolting. So he, he puts it on, he takes it out the old man, puts it on himself. And what's kind of funny is Christopher Walken would have orgasmed standing up viewing this tape. He would have messed himself. They, they suspension disbelief that out of the story. The guy was in the hospital for a little while in the movie. But when he came out, he felt amazing. He was like, oh, I'm reborn, you know. But this technology, it covers the rest of the game. So AI is taking care of the visual game. Sound. Sound will eventually be taken care of by the AI. I don't even think that'll be a problem whatsoever. The AI out of Sora is three-dimensional. So it knows if it puts something behind you, if that makes sense. If you're on a subway looking out a window in Japan, it knows, oh, I put a few people and they're murmuring in the background or whatever. The more it learns about reality, the more it'll be able to simulate it. And it'll be in stereo. Which means if some guy's, you know, coming up to you and talking, hey, buddy, you got a, you got a light for a cigarette, you'll look over and it'll be, the person will be there and it will, their mouth moves away from you, so does the sound source, right? Just like Adobe technology, the Atmos system, it does it today. It was like seven points of distinct sound arenas in one thing. Most of you play video games have already experienced this with the headset. But we still have to take care of touch, smell, 
a taste. Okay. Well, there's actually solutions for smell right now, except they're physical. Uh, there was a unit that I was hired to see if I could promote. We actually came up with a really cool concept for them. But it's a little unit that has um, these little plastic containers of oils with all the different types of smell combinations. And it, what, it's, what it essentially did was say, if you see an orange, it'll go in the room and you get a little burst of this oil in your face. I was concerned about the health hazards of the whole thing, but I wasn't on the hook for it. You see a skunk, it'll make a skunk. You see a strawberry, strawberry, whatever, right? Car drives by, you'll get the smog out of the pipe. Touch. Well, that, you know, once they start talking to your brain, they're going to get to that point. They're going to get to everything. Right now, we're trying to create a headset, a VR headset that actually has enough resolution that you feel comfortable with it. Apple's finding out the hard way with 80% returns on the Apple Vision 1 that uh, it's very difficult to get that bright enough and seamless enough with reality that um, customers are willing to wear a trash can on their head. I've been in think tanks in Los Angeles with some of the most powerful video game people on planet Earth, plus other State Department people and all kinds of stuff, and they're basically saying, I don't want to wear a piece of crap on my head. Even if it's a pair of glasses, I don't want to have to wear anything. Don't mess up my game, basically, right? Of what you look like. So a gentleman by the name of Arthur C. Clarke, who was a NASA scientist who basically conceptualized the geocentric orbit, and eventually got to Stanley Kubrick and put together the book 2001 A Space Odyssey, the script. He wrote the book kind of at the same time. He continued writing several versions, 2010, and then he got all the way up to 3001. The 2001 was very interesting. It's not a good book. Let me just tell you. It's an old school sci-fi book where a guy just talks about, I mean, if he, he talks about how to make toast. I mean, you know, to that degree, I'm, I'm being facetious, but he talks about stuff at nauseum that doesn't have story. It's a scientist trying to be scientific, right? But the one thing that was kind of laughable, I read this book probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Whatever it came out, I got it and read it. As he said that certain people will have their head shaved. It was almost everybody, but you have your head shaved and you put one of those Merlin caps on your head and it's talking to your head. I thought to myself, you know, that's going to be, I've seen brainstorms, so I'm thinking, well, that's going to be unnecessary. Why would you, and it was shaving your head. I mean, it's just like your hair is going to grow. It just, it's a painful paradigm that he created to accomplish the goal. However, the goal is the goal. Musk is trying to put chips in your head. So let's think about that. Something you would never want to have happen to yourself because then you lose you. There's an old uh, role-playing game called Shadowrun. It was conceptualized in the 80s. It was one of the coolest games. Hard to play. It was like Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons a little bit, but it's future. They've since polluted it by putting Dungeons and Dragons in there where you got all kinds of or orcs and elves and <laughs> stuff. But initially, it was just human beings. And then there was a game that used that called Deus Ex. It was released in 1997. But there was a principle of Shadowrun that is starting to become, it will become, more and more of a reality for your future. And the literal brilliance of these individuals to conceptualize this in a room and I don't know if they got this off other sci-fi books. You can tell me if you've read about this. I'm sure that's probably the case. I just never ran into it in any books that I ever read. But they have something called your essence. And when you start off your character, this is important. When you start off your character in this role-playing system, you have 100% essence if you're 100% human. And as you replace things in your body, because this, this, this gaming system had... You know, you could do the Wolverine skeleton. You could do what's called, uh, was it rapid reflexes? And you could replace your nervous system with a computer. But each one of these technologies that you put inside your body removed your essence. It removed your humanity. Because we know through epigenetics and De La, De La Mark that we actually have 
you know, we are an epigenetic being. We actually are made of electricity as a very crucial part to being healthy and being alive. It makes the computer that is the human body 100% complete. If you have any doubt about that, just conceptualize a computer where electrons can't flow through certain chips and therefore those chips don't work. It's no longer a full computer. It doesn't have sound anymore. It can't do floating point calculations. It doesn't do any GPU work. Well, you'll find out that the human body, the more you put the crap in your body, there is a point when you become RoboCop. You become a cyborg. You're merely a brain hovering inside of some mechanical body. Now imagine, there's been movies made, <laughs> The Man with Two Brains, that's a good one. But there's been movies made all the way back to the 50s where you know they had a way to suspend a head on a table with like, you know, liquid in them. There's two or three of them on riff tracks alone. What does it take to keep the flesh of a brain going? Basically some artificial blood. The cells have to be oxygenated and nourished. Well, you know, we could probably create some little special goo to keep a brain alive. Imagine that. Maybe the eyes exist. Maybe the eyes are being supplanted with some sort of software. In the 80s, if you watch the show uh, Computer Chronicles from about 83 to about 89, those are the episodes that are just absolute genius episodes. They talk about this, uh, I think about 83 to 85, there's a scientist that comes in and they were already calculating how much data the human brain processes at any one split second. And of course, this is ignoring the fact we most likely have a soul of energy that is who we really are, right? Hence, out-of-body experiences and all kinds of other you know, paranormal stuff that occurs. I can't remember the data rate that they talked about. But it wasn't as much as you thought, and it's probably incredibly incorrect in the 80s. But let's say we take whatever amount of data they prophesized or theorized in the 80s, and let's multiply that times 100. A couple more zeros on the end of that estimation. Well, how much faster is a cell phone than a Cray computer, which was the fastest computer by 1982, right? Barring some, you know, computer in a warehouse that we're unaware of. Well, the cell phone, the 4S, Apple 4S, was nearly 5,000 times faster than a Cray computer. 5,000 times faster. I mean, you, you may go, oh, well, yeah, but that's, that's a massive amount of uh, Moore's Law kicking some serious ass. Well, how much faster do you think your current cell phone is than an S4 or 4S, right? How much faster is a supercomputer? How much faster is your desktop computer with a GTX 4090 GPU card? And what's coming next? And what's coming next? And what's coming next? By 2050, it is safe to say that whatever you're holding in your hand in 2050 is going to be a million times faster than this, this fourth generation iPhone. New technologies are going to come out. Now, of course, this entire premise of this episode is to suggest that the wherewithal that we have right now is going to persist in man in 2050. I have my doubts. For every, you know, was it year and a half, the uh, technology gets twice as fast, Moore's Law. I think that's the interval. Man is getting more ignorant and more ignorant and more ignorant to the extent of Moore's Law. Part of that's because of the cultural revolution of uh, idiocy on TikTok and that kind of stuff. Facebook, Instagram, all these things just make you more and more stupid, more and more nonlinear thinking. And it's making people angry that they're stupid. It's really funny. The education's getting bad. But as software and robotics start taking over the tasks of man, man will become increasingly atrophied. Our bodies will be atrophied, just like the third act of uh, the movie Wally. e They have the fat people in the floating cars with bones that don't even touch each other because they don't need to. They've never lifted anything in their entire lives. Some form of that, maybe not the bone thing, but definitely the mental aptitude and the very nature of the human body will atrophy down. Men are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? You're Johnny Depp's of the world. Teeny tiny guys, 
Filmed to look large, but teeny tiny. That was the trend hatched in the 90s. So, this is more of an observation from our timeline to their timeline. But if you thought introducing UFOs to a religious community would shake their very belief in God, wait till they can put on a headset. Or, sorry, they could surplant their eyes. They could put contact lenses in. They could do uh, some little chip like Black Mirror, some little puck on the side of their head, right over their temple, communicating milliamps right into the visual cortex. Maybe some weird thing on the back of your head. Who knows? We don't need to worry about how they're going to do it least yet. But when you can turn on a reality and live in, in your favorite movie, and you could just have a movie, watch a Humphrey Bogart movie from 1948, and it'll just figure out the room, figure out the architecture, and just paint you into that reality. You want to be a, a dude in a holodeck? Well, you don't have to go to the holodeck. It's just like Black Mirror. You just jack in. Well, they don't seem to be scared of that ripping of reality. They're only scared of, what, admitting they found UFOs somewhere? Seems funny, right? Every single year between now and 2050, for those of us who came up before the internet especially, but even kids that grew up with the internet, and they're going to tell their grandchildren, well, we didn't have this VR stuff, you know, we didn't have this alternate reality stuff. We had, to, we had to go to a movie theater and buy popcorn for $50 and uh, a Coke for $20 and have the old guy next to us rumbling a bag while we're trying to watch the movie. We had to sit in a room that smelled like feet, like old socks. And now your kids, 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 uh, they'll be living in realities that don't necessarily make any technical sense. Well, I mentioned it recently. I want to just touch on it for a split second. Look what the pornographic industry has done to couples today. It's made, you know, erectile dysfunction pills go off the charts because everything's screwed up in the brain. Well, take that, subtract out the sexual model, but it'll exist as well in a whole different category, and then start just messing with everyday reality. Now, could this technology be used for good? Absolutely. What are some of the cool things they could use it for? Well, you don't have to go to college anymore, at least physically. You just put the chip on and watch class. And the class could literally figure out what you know up to this point through big machine learning. Because the computer is going to have a profile of everyone. You're going to know it has a profile of you eventually. It will have been secretly generated, you know, from about 2000 and up. Facebook's launch is the launch of that project from DARPA. So if your kid has a learning disability, the class will adjust if it really wants you to learn something. But of course, the indoctrination will be absolute. There won't be a point where anyone has access to play with this technology who isn't part of the state. As we learned about in the... Uh, episode about the obsolete man. I'm going to be Burgess Meredith in the future. I know it. There is a God. But how would anyone hang on to God in the middle of this world? It would have to be something exceptionally instinctual in man. But if they do erase churches, how do they erase churches? Well, technically speaking, a church could fund a program where you put the puck on your head and you're all generated in a computer and you feel like you're a church. I don't know how you would take communion and drink the wine and all that kind of stuff. It could make you feel like you're doing it, but if you don't do it, then you're not really doing it and your religion is trash, right? If that's what you believe is a sacrament. I don't think churches are going to be allowed to exist in the future. The church will be the state, just like Orwell said. But today we have this paradigm going back to the beginning of time for mankind that says if you see it, then it was real. Seeing is believing. Well, you won't be able to ever say that by 2050 because what you see is what they've generated. 
and you will know it is not real. And so the idea of Neo being in this this little egg, as this embryonic version of himself, although fully grown apparently, you know, and he gets flushed out and he gets picked up by uh, Morpheus and the gang. Eh, no need for that. No need for you to be stored in some location. I mean, maybe, who knows? But why would you travel to Paris if you can travel to Paris from your living room? The whole need to go outside would be one of maybe, oh, the sun is this weird thing in the sky that feels good. It could cut down on crime. It could increase crime. How could it cut down on crime? Well, why does a criminal do what they need to do? As long as the state will feed you and shelter you and you have a place to get clean, then you're pretty, pretty good. Because if you wanted a Ferrari, if you wanted a Lamborghini, if you wanted a spaceship, if you wanted something, well, they could sanction the programs that you get on this little guy. Just like the second episode, season one of Black Mirror, where the, the guy pedaled the bike. Never know. Maybe that's how you earn your points to have access to the programs. It's, it's such a slippery slope on every single dimension of existence because it is existence. This technology is existence. The real crux of the brain chip, human chip thing, regardless of where they put it or put them, and you need to brace for this, and I, I don't know if I've ever heard of any real program for this, but they're going to go after babies. They're going to go after babies. They might actually create some fake success stories, maybe some real success stories. This eight-year-old has an IQ of 250. You want to test him? Well, turn off your program, kid. Talk to me about jet propulsion, ethereal technologies, whatever it is. Whatever a dumb person considers smart makes the other person seem smart and they get all the points on the test. It's the way intelligence works. It's really strange. There's definitely several of you who watch this show who I know have been told that you're a genius. You're super smart. Da, da, da. It's not like you're not smart. But you'll look at them and you'll think in the back of your head, man, I am totally smart, but I never, I never said anything in this conversation that I think is really intelligent. Of course, in the lexicon of the show, I say smart is more like Jeopardy, memorizing and repeating bullshit, and intelligence is actually doing something with empirical data that you have, right? So I shouldn't abuse those two words. But true intelligence is sometimes not demonstrated, but someone will be all goo eyed for you because you know way more than they do. Why? Because they haven't put any effort into learning anything ever. But now think about this. When you go back to the question of life, the universe, and everything, it really gets down to, and the comedy that Douglas Adams wrote in the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was, again, the really real way to ingest that entire story is through the BBC original broadcasts, because that's where it's chronologically correct. The books are all screwed up. So if you like the books, wait till you hear the radio broadcast of it. You want to get the LP versions off of YouTube. But the computer couldn't figure out what the question was because it's so generic. So the comedy was, it came up with a number 42. By the way, the computer was called Deep Thoughts. And I have to admit, I probably thought about that subconsciously when I named this show. Deep Thoughts. Man has a purpose. The more generic life was in your respective area of the world, the more that you were in tune with the old school God-given purpose for being in this planet, right? Being in this plane of existence. For most people, prior to the 20th century, it was about raising families and surviving. That was it. Yeah, you know, we got some science and sciences in there after Newton came around and universities started proliferating the world's canvas, right? But overall, it was very meat and potatoes for probably a million years. What happens when you create a false utopia using a technology that can create infinite realities? Infinite realities. Imagine <laughs> there's no problem 
telling ChatGPT to talk to Dolly, which is the image generation cousin, it gives your words to Dolly and Dolly creates the image if you're not familiar with this. But you can say living room, on uh, create a living room on an acid trip. Those two phrases and boom, it creates the most amazing thing you've ever seen in your life. Okay. Well, imagine having super ignorant human beings that just, they don't really have that reference because they're not smart enough to have a historical reference like LSD. But they'll just say, bright colors, neat place. And those, uh, uh, you know, and it's like your kids, your kids satisfied. But if you redefine what a parent is, and you raise parents to really be more like Alex Huxley's Brave New World, where the parents and the child have no relationship. They're birthed in a birthing clinic. The parents and the child never meet. Maybe even uh, they're just contributing sperm and eggs, and, and it just happens. Uh, will man ever figure out how to create the miracle of life completely out of synthetics? I doubt it. They're always going to have to have genetic material to pull this off. The only thing I could see is that somehow they're able to clone, meaning trick the DNA to create another copy of itself. So a woman who's run out of eggs, if she has even one egg, she can have that thing duplicate as many times as she wants and checked out for all kinds of anomalies. Same with the man stuff, right? But in the end, when you totally fracture the definition of reality, the only thing that could possibly bring reality back to the human condition would be a, some sort of cataclysmic event where all the power's out. But then if you have a bunch of human beings that can't wipe their own ass and they've had robots do everything for them, maybe the robots have sympathy on them and, and nurse them back into the dark ages so they could at least build a hut and stay away from, you know, get an animal and eat it. But we've, we've got an issue. This is funny. It's kind of a segue that relates to this. There was a... a some type of doctor on Joe Rogan's show. And he was talking about the health of teeth. And he said that a lot, since so much of the food in the world today is soft, that the teeth really don't grow like they should. We're basically eating baby food 24-7. And I thought about it for a split second. I was thinking, I said, well, what's, you know, what's considered to be non-baby food? And it would be tough meats, um, eating something that you have to really chew on. Because, I mean, you think about like, well, if you've ever seen um, people in tropical areas uh, peel a coconut, a lot of times they'll do it with their hand, but a lot of times they have a mouth routine and they just peel this thing down and they go for it. I bet their chompers are amazing, you know. Look at all the beasts of the world, the beasts that have to eat. They're not eating ice cubes and that kind of stuff. They're eating meat. And they're having to pull out the, you know, pull the skin off to get to the meat underneath. Okay, interesting. So now you take society has been living in this virtual world. I don't even know how you eat in the, in the, you know, the future. Does it come in some weird TV dinner? Does it come in some soylent green puck? Who knows? We're definitely going to have to eat. We're definitely going to have to drink. But we've seen people on life support in hospitals. And glucose drips and gives them your moist, gives you the, you know, the liquid that you need and the sugar that you need. Now, you don't want to sit in a hospital for a long time because then you're, what happens? You can't walk when you first get out. You get wheelchair at home, you go to physical therapy for six months to learn how to walk again. How many times have you heard that when people get injured? Well, imagine incubating that existence because you've got tech all over you constantly. Your essence gets reduced like the game Shadowrun. In Shadowrun, you're not to eclipse 50%, because then you're going down the slippery slope of cyborgism. But I think the greater thing is when you start replacing reality and the hardships of reality with luxury, who's going to think about their purpose in life? Which is really where you get this amazing orgasm from God. It's way bigger than any sexual orgasm. It is. It really is. Once you do something that seems like your destiny and you accomplish it, whether you accomplish it in a small way or a large way, think about how Steve Jobs must felt, must have felt when he and Wozniak released the first personal microcomputer. 
and then another one and another one. Then he basically resigns, rightfully so. And he gets out for a little while and he comes back and he immediately creates the iPod. And his invention makes almost $50 billion the first 12 months. And he creates the iTunes store. And now all of a sudden, instead of uh, ripping everything off the internet for free, you're paying for it. Wow, inventing an industry. Then the tablet. Then these, even though they hated the cube, it turned into the mini. The mini is one of the most, that's what I have at home. It's the most sought after little computers. That just keeps going and going and going. That dude was just beyond a sexual satisfaction when these products were finally adopted. He only had one stinker his whole life. The Newton came out when he wasn't there, the handheld unit. But guess what? The Newton turned into the smartphone. All those algorithms eventually made it. These people were just so ahead of their time. Like Xerox creating the mouse, the laser printer, the GUI. They got turned down. The company basically defunded it. Steve Jobs gave him $110 million worth of stock. Assholes say that he stole it. And it became the first uh, Lisa computer operating system by 1979. That gets a race, potentially. Now, can you have sub-paradigms of reward within these virtual realities? Oh, sure. You ever played a video game of any kind and beat the boss? You ever played a coin-op game if you're really old and you beat the boss? You feel amazing. How much um, relevance is that to the rest of your world community? Not much. Do you really think they're going to solve world hunger? It's a business. Do you think they're ever going to solve the renegade abandoned dogs around the world so that you don't have to rescue a dog? No, it's a business. It's a bit. People get all wrapped up in these things and you're an asshole if you buy a well-bred dog. But those dogs that are screwing in the alleyway are never going to stop screwing in the alleyway. Assholes buy dogs and cats and abandon them of all these different species of animals. And you can make yourself feel good for rescuing one. Well, good for you. That's good. Nothing wrong with doing that. But don't blame anybody else for not taking care of every single renegade animal. The veterinarians love it. You rescue a dog, you are on the hook for four to eight grand of bills to them. They love it. You're an annuity to them. You just don't even know it. But then there's the movie THX 1138. Oh, man, maybe that's why I covered all those movies. It gets down to a fascist world with bald heads. Would the virtual reality thing ever sunset? Or whatever you want to call this new, like, ultra reality. Yes, it absolutely will. Because it takes effort. Now, will the algorithms become so common that it just basically comes with your serial prize? Yes, absolutely. But the narcissist weirdos that want to control people and control the world because that's what they have convinced themselves is their Luciferian destiny. They don't want you at home having fun. They don't want you to loop that tape and have that orgasm in your den. They want you working for them. They want you suffering for them because they are genetically inferior, weird people. And they just so happen to control virtually everything that is our world, right? You know it to be true. Isn't it interesting, just as a slight side note on their behalf, that if you read about, you know, the Roman Caesars and the Roman Senate before it all crashed, they had uh, females that they would breed with to make children, but only to make an error. And most of them dated men. They had all kinds of concubines of men everywhere. And now there are so many stories about world leaders where their wives are guys. That is just a repeat of the Roman Empire. But whatever happened to the Roman Empire, it fell. Every single time there's a gender dysphoria thing, a culture falls. Not sure why, actually. People aren't invited to that party, so the people are still making humans. It's just strange. But it gets to the point where I guess they're not paying attention and the people finally rise up and nail them, right? We celebrate in our realities revolutions that change the world for the better. At least that's how it's romantically written. With technology to reduce population, with medicines, to medicine, medical technology, I should say, to make sure you don't live that long, it's going to be a movie like Logan's Run. Oh, another movie I covered. 
where someone escapes the interior city, which is underground. They escape outside and they realize there's a sun and the sun feels good. It's just the ultra design of the human condition in this cosmology. That we have a sun that is born every day. The sun is born. It lives, it dies, and it resurrects every morning. Gee, I wonder where we got that story from, you know? What if the sun is subtracted? God is subtracted. Oh, yeah, there's a little wiggly phase of maybe 30, 40 years where they handle those who still remember what a church is. They handle those obsolete men who still, and women who still have Bibles hidden away somewhere. But they'll find them all. And they know you'll die. So as long as they don't lose their control apparatus, they got us. What's really beneficial to, I think, the the 95% normal human beings on this planet with this gender dysphoria thing, got to be careful how many times I say that, is that it shows humanity the Orwell algorithm of how many lights are on. Right? There's four lights on, and you're supposed to say there's five. What's two plus two? It equals five. They want that cognitive dissonance to take hold so that you accept whatever you're told. Because if they turn off your wonderful world generator, and you're not in necessarily a nice living room like you are today or in a nice car like you might be today listening to this on a podcast, you wake up and you're in a tin box. And it's cold and it's not nice. You're not going to die because that's not the point. But you've been penalized by losing your entire reality. And they say, you got to go do this if you want any more time on the machine. The unit's already in your brain, but it's not going to activate unless your social credit system's up, unless you labor and do whatever they say. We talk about it all the time in the world today, that we know that Hollywood and the music industry has been plagued with these absolute perverts, man. And it's because people want to be on the silver screen. People want to be, well, they want to have their destiny is, is the big thrust, And if somebody says, well, if you do that and do this, I'll give you a shot. I'll put you up there. I said it a long time ago, and I'll just mention it briefly. It's like, it's so prevalent that I was talking to a friend of mine. And I made a joke about someone providing sexual favors to someone else to get a job to get some money or whatever, who they're not, that's not their profession. Okay. And my friend looked at me and had this face of like really uh, being hurt. And they said something like, well, I didn't want to. Woof. I learned a big lesson about running my mouth in in any circle of the Hollywood realm. Because people that you don't know have done these things and they did not mean to do these things. They didn't want to do these things, but they had their whole life put on hold unless they did those things. It's a sobering moment, let me tell you. But that's how prevalent it is. So imagine an entire world that's forced into that situation as opposed to the, the incredible elite actresses and singers and whatever and actors that are forced into it through the paradigm of being famous, that disease. And most people don't necessarily want to be famous. They just want to portray fiction. It's something they're really talented at. I'm going to make a prediction that this stuff will be so powerful so quickly. Again, if they don't race everyone off the planet, okay. That even people my age, Uh, I would say even 30 and up. Maybe everyone on planet Earth. I think it goes without saying that 30 and under could be susceptible to this, but maybe it's more like 10 and under will be the generation that grows up into this. But folks that think that they would never, ever, ever become susceptible to this will convert easily into this. 
Imagine if nothing else, if they were able to get to that stage of the brainstorm system, talking to all five senses. I do think that it would take to 2050 because there's a lot of biological technologies. And the only, the only exception is just like AI being dropped in 2023 that blew our minds, especially as technical people like myself, you're, it's just unbelievable what you can ask ChatGPT and just get answers and code examples and just whatever. I asked it last night, hey, I'm thinking about writing this type of application for Windows 11. What do you, could you help me write the application? Sure, it just starts barfing out code. Okay, so my point about mentioning that is if this technology has already reached that state behind the curtain and we're only waiting for its, its gradual introduction to society. Then it's done. It'll simply get more refined as they get more data back from putting it out on billions of people. What's the, what's the thing that, that drives leaders crazy? Complaining. Being recognized for being a shitty leader. Why was the Coliseum created? Why are sports the number one pastime of at least Americans... It's to make you look over there while they're doing that over there. Well, you know, politics sucks. I'm going to watch this game. Wow. They love that. They absolutely love that kind of person. There is a, if they could give you a prize, they'd give it to you. Administering medications to a human being is a very noticeable intrusion on the human being's perception of what's going on in their world. But just like the movie Looker, the guy lamented about the fact that if you try to force people to ingest information from a government to their, their conscripts, they know that they're being told something that may or may not be true. Plus, it's taking up their time. They'd rather be doing something else. But this guy said accurately, look, television is something they want to do, and they watch 50 hours a week. I mean, a month or something like that. And it's like... He says, it's a captive audience that self-captivates so that we can tell a vision of what we want them to believe. Well, now imagine that thing taking over everything in your body. It will chemically manipulate your brain to believe things. Again, like I tell you all the time, there's a chemical sequence that fires in your brain for a true, what you believe to be true. And there's one that fires for what you believe to be false and then when it doesn't fire correctly, you get a maybe going on. But maybes are distressful pieces of information because it's an unresolved equation in your head. It's like when you try to go to sleep before you solve the problem that you discovered earlier that day. Your brain works on it so much that when you take a shower the next morning, a lot of times you, you, know, you and I will be in showers. And it's like, oh my God, there it is. There's the solution. But what about a system that knows that? What about a system that knows everything about you? And because every idiot in the world gives all their data to these Project Looking Glass AIs that are building unbelievably meticulous, multidimensional profiles on you. It's not like the uh, Son of Sam profiles or those serial killers from back in the day. They know everything about you. What clothes you wear. How do you make your hair? What sunglasses do you wear? What food do you eat? How much do you drive? Then they know how much you live inside a car. And they just know, well, they're like this. So what you got to do is touch them like that. And they do this. We say jump and they say how far. And if you birth children into this system, there is no other system to exist but this system that the state has put down for you. The control is absolute, just absolutely, you have no control over your real life. But here's the rub. Only our generation knows that we had freedom and it was taken away. Their generation won't know what freedom is, so they won't, they won't care. We've always been doing this, right? There's a Twilight Zone, I forget its name, it's... Uh, Something about the shadows or something. It's a kind of a dumb name. The, the episode should have been called Pleasant Valley. But it's about a guy who drives into a town. And the town's kind of weird. And uh, his dog jumps out of his car. And a little girl zaps it because it's chasing it, her cat. The 
cats jumped up high and the dog's down below barking and the chick goes ping and the dog disappears and the guy sees it and he's like, oh my God, what'd you do to my dog? Well, he finds out that this town has technology given to them by this dude. I've talked about it recently, I know. But he finally meets this wonderful woman named Ellen at the local um, hotel and he's trying to convince her, look, you know, you've got this technology that could do anything and so why don't we help the entire world instead of you guys sitting in this glass cage of yours telling us that we're bad but you're about to kill me because i saw what you don't want anyone else to see i have to stay in your town or you're going to kill me and it becomes evident that she is unaware that there's suffering in the world and she says why would i ever want to leave when i have everything that i ever needed here imagine that times a hundred in all five senses there's a common statement that will be said has been said for the entire existence of mankind. And it goes something like this. It's never said the same exact way, so I'll paraphrase. It essentially says that as long as you have a partner, your sex is free. And you can do that if you're broke, right? So you can always have a little bit of happiness, and man, you can at least uh, work on yourself if that doesn't work out until you find that person or whatever, right? Imagine a future where you have to earn the right and pay for an orgasm because the system controls you 100%. Whoa. Talk about the little game that they play in Hollywood. It's every single human being at that point. This is where we're headed. And the more the people cheer on guys like Elon Musk and think he's so fucking cool because he smokes a joint on Joe Rogan's show. Joe Rogan has been so fucking high on his shows lately it's a joke that he says anything serious anymore. I want you to observe that one. Nothing against the guy, but if he thinks he's influencing anybody, it's, it's a smaller and smaller demographic of people who want to see a guy who's completely high, you know, look at his hand for 10 minutes, you know. But Elon is a billionaire child. Before he ever did anything in life, he's a billionaire child. And everyone just said, well, you know what he did? He, he built his own companies. And, yeah, well, it's not too bad when you can get $10 billion in government subsidies and never have to put your own money in. Why is he worth a lot of money? Because he's never spent any of his own. If he's a good guy, I'll be so fucking shocked. But no good guy should be running in trying to put chips in human beings. He should be the exact opposite person. He should be trying to rebuild the childhood that made him supposedly this autistic physicist that he supposedly is it's so strange that humanity wants to grow up one way and they love who they are they're proud of who they are lumps bumps and everything and then they want to absolutely change the paradigm of existence for the next generation thinking that those kids are going to turn out anything like them again if you know any rich people in this world i don't give a crap it's in your hometown no matter what rich is this applies to your town the kids of that person have about an 80 to 90% chance of being the biggest losers on planet Earth. The biggest losers on planet Earth. They have no idea what a gallon of milk costs. They've never suffered. If they screw up their life and get into drugs and do all this, mommy and daddy come in and rescue the kid. The kid never learns anything because it becomes a game of the parents protecting their own reputation. It has nothing to do with their kid anymore. They just want to basically mute the child, not kill them because they don't want to go to hell. They just want to mute that kid's defective genes so they can look at themselves in the mirror and go, good job. Now at least the neighbors don't know as much. That would all vanish. By the 70s in America, the parent was the enemy. The household with the mother at home until she gets the kids up to the point they get picked up by the bus and they can take care of themselves because we could. Then she can go uh, right into the work industry and make a ton of cash, you know? So they attacked it and they won. They totally won. I used to think it was going to go into the rollerball world where you would still have a physical sport. You had the citizens, the rollerballers, and then the executives. That's how the movie goes. Now I think we're going to skip the rollerball realm because it's going to go, rollerball is going to get replaced by Ready Player One comatose people. 
just working for the next program, working for the next chapter of something. Worlds like Westworld, they won't need to physically exist because they will exist in your head. The one thing about Westworld that was really interesting was that you couldn't shoot, the, the hosts couldn't shoot the guests. Oh, they could take a shot at you, but no bullet would go through your body. The funny thing is, is that uh, if the guns ever got swapped and a host didn't know, they could technically pull the trigger on you and kill you. But in a virtual game reality where everything is photo real, and by the way, once you never let a child see the real world, even if you're missing a few details, they don't know because they've never seen anything to reference it against. And once they pop out of the game, they want to go back in as fast as possible. So it's not a matter of I popped out of the game and now I'm looking around and remembering things. No, no, no. It's popping out of the game going, what hell is this? Let me back into the dream world. At that point, you do all the things they did in this series on HBO. There's a reason why nothing can kill you. And then imagine erasing death in the the Matrix. We may go through several decades where this unit is something we use like a game console, like we use a television show. Uh, You know, I don't know if, I think most of you are my age or just right around my age, but there was a time, boys and girls, when we would wake up, go to work or school, come home, and then it was television time. It was after dinner, usually. My house, we did this dinner and TV at the same time. And then you would go to bed, and TV was off, and there was just TV time. And parents, luckily where I live, they still sanction TV time and game time and phone time with their kids. At least that's something, right? So imagine, you know, the, say between 2030 and 2050, it's more like a television type thing. You get time on the fantasy world. But how could they catalyze this to be ultra, ultra accepted? Well, I'll give you one example already. Imagine disadvantaged kids anywhere in the world to put this little thing on, however it's form factored. And that's something that's covered in the movie Brainstorm. It goes from this huge contraption at the beginning of the movie to this beautiful little thing that uh, Natalie Wood, you know, refined down. That was her job. She was a package person, right? But education, kids start putting this on to get education. Maybe it's not all five senses at first. Maybe it's just the virtual reality. The students have avatars, which are like way beyond uh, what their physical prowess really is in real life. So you could be a 300 pound kid and you're going to go in looking like Brad Pitt. And then you have uh, some, like remember Avatar when it comes out? There's a special thing about Avatar and Avatar 2, and technically speaking, Tron Legacy, but I, didn't, I never had that offered in 3D in my world. But it was actually filmed with a real 3D camera. But it was this groundbreaking movie when it comes to technology, a movie that took 12 years to put together. There's over 320 babies born from the cast and crew, mainly the crew, of course, during the production of that film. Okay. It was something that everybody wanted to see. Okay, so there is something that's introduced as this catalyst to get everybody into the platform. You know, the internet was around in 1993, and it was pretty sterile. Nothing really catalyzed internet, you know, use until Friendster came around and then MySpace came around. MySpace was the first true fentanyl of the internet. Everybody had to have it, man. I had to let go of my first employee in my video video game company because she was just doing nothing but MySpace. And we had, uh, I think, $40,000 in invoices waiting to be mailed. But the 21st century and the launch of Facebook was it. The DARPA program went down. Was it Rupert bought MySpace and just canned it? That was his purpose for buying it. Friendster turned into some penthouse uh, thing. I almost got hired to clean it up after it was going to be bought off them. But they finally realized the juggernaut's too big to mess with. And then, you know, there's another 12 different social media platforms out there. So this will be incorporated into how people manage their lives. 
It'll be the Jones uh, keep it up appearances algorithm of, well, you haven't been to this. You haven't seen that. Well, what are you doing? Your kids still walk to an actual school and have a physical teacher. Well, how's that gangster playground up there? My kids, you know, they sit in the posh room and they get their you know, Harvard education and they never move once. But imagine, too, I'm just riffing a little bit here, but imagine you have food that's nutri- nutritious, but tastes like dog shit. Okay, well, if a computer can control your brain's interpretation of taste and smell, hmm, you could just be given a soil and green puck made of human beings and eat it. Uh, crickets and all kinds of other great uh, toxic stuff for your body. And it's telling you it tastes like whatever the hell you think you're... Well, the computer's going to know what you think tastes good. It'll give you a little taste test. It's good, bad. It can just literally hit your tongue and listen to your brain. It doesn't even have to ask you. Imagine getting a battery uh, initialization of the software. And it just goes ting, 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 back and forth. And it goes, I know exactly what you like to eat. Here you go. Eat your soil and the green chip. To you, it's going to look like, you know, a croissant from Paris. And it'll just be dirt, <laughs> you know, but it keeps you alive, right? So you could technically never have to break out of your reality. And your hands could be integrated into the reality as well. That's already been done. That has already been done. The uh, meta system does it. Apple system does it. These things are just going to get more and more powerful. Isn't it interesting that Apple has apparently up to an 80% return on Apple Vision 1 units, which costs $4,000. They've announced they're not going to modify the thing until 2027, which is three years away. Okay. And they're sticking with it. Okay. Well, what if they knew what I'm telling you in this episode? Of course, they're going to stick with it. It is the future. Now, let's do the uh, No Country for Old Men analysis here at the end. Am I just being an old fart and not, you know, endorsing what could be the most brilliant advancement in human history? Well, it gets down to that twilight zone with Pleasant Valley. There's a point where that guy with the dog and the girl, he gets pulled into the mayor and his two sidekicks. They're not bad men. But they're the overseers of this technology, and they explain to this guy the, the dilemma that they're in. This system has infinite everything. Everything. But he says we can't give it to humanity because humanity will incubate it fairly immediately into a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> the guy's right. And, of course, the actor's got to play like he thinks that's the worst idea on planet Earth. The whole thing with the movie Brainstorm, what you're going to find out is that this incredible technology was immediately captured by the military and turned into some horrific stuff. It comes down to one really basic thing. If we can't get a vote counted, then everything will go bad because they will have absolute control over your government. And the more that you think your government should be involved in your life and control all your medicine and control what you think is true and what is false, you can't apply your own knowledge. You can't. It's not allowed by the state, as you found on the obsolete man. Then it will turn into an absolute nightmare of technology. Whereas if we could control the very standards by which technology is applied to man... And we have an apparatus to catch and incarcerate and potentially execute those that would harm man, violating the one law of the universe, which is common law, do no harm. If we could get that in place and maybe even create AI to find these people, maybe, maybe we could control how this technology is applied to the human form. I'm not holding my breath, right? How will the history books look back on this era if it goes dark? You know, what if we all turn to Ready Ready Player One, you know, virtual reality people? They won't even call it that. They'll call their stuff reality. Guarantee it. 
So it'll be the generation of, I don't know, fanatics, what we call fanatics because we like reality, reality. And it'll be the utopian generation or something where you renew at 30 years old, like Logan's run. Will it be a crime to even complain? I mean, they're trying to control your brain right now, which is through group think. They're trying to say, you can't dislike what the state says you can't dislike. And you, in, in, um, by design, in its reverse, you can't love what they don't say you can't love. And you have to love what they say you have to love. I should say it that way. What a weird thing. It goes against everything that man knows about life. You know, I told you guys a long time ago in an episode that if you took, you take any animal and you put them in a small cage, they want out of the cage because they know they're in a cage. But once you build a container big enough, like a safari, you can have animals in there all the time and they don't even know they're in one. They get to move around as much as they want to move around. They get to explore as much as they want to explore. However, when they find the fence, even though there might be 50 miles of land behind them, they want to break that fence down. And they're just primitive animals with the God of an instinct of freedom. Now, of course, the game is make slaves out of people, but tell them that they're free. We know that's the way the world is today. Okay, so you try to redefine your sphere of influence and your life to have all the freedom that you want and not need anything that is not accessible to you. It's, it's, it's sort of a tiny flavor of if you can't beat them, join them. But you flip the script a little bit so you feel comfortable. Like they're trying to make sure we don't travel a lot right now. All this bad news about Boeing planes and United Airlines and Alaska Airlines how much do you want to fly in a jet once you see a big tire come off a jet and crash into a bunch of parked cars? And then, I mean, I don't know, Boeing's had a half a dozen almost tragic death accidents recently. Hiring diversity over talent, right? I don't mind hiring diversity. Just get them trained up to the point where they're the experts and you will have fixed the problem, and then you then you let them touch the planes. Don't let them touch the planes before they actually get the expertise in them, right? If you live in an area that you love, then you're good. You're like, I love my house. I love walking out the front door. I like my yard. I like the general surroundings of where I live. They make you think that you need to travel. That's the weird thing. I know that sounds counterintuitive. We want freedom to do those things if we want to. But I've met a lot of kids and a lot of adults that, that lament at length about how they feel incomplete in the world because they haven't traveled the world. I want to travel the world and travel the world. It's like, you want to travel the world because you haven't traveled the world. Once you start traveling the world, and I know this because I have at times had, you know, very wealthy people in my life who have traveled the world. I only met one guy in the whole world. He likes to fly on jets. He likes to be the number one frequent flyer of a particular airline constantly. He wants to be number one. He does not want to be number two, but it's some weird fetish he's got. Strange, man. But most of the folks I meet, they have one place in the world that out of all the places they travel, Northern Italy is typically the number one pick. They A lot of times they have family there and that kind of stuff, but there's usually maybe one destination they really like, Costa Rica or something like that. But in terms of needing to travel the world, something that they, they can afford to do at any moment in time, they just go, I, I kind of circled the world once and yeah, whatever. And they just really try to focus on what most of us focus on without having that, that desire. They want to live in a nice place that for their preferences, their temperature preferences, their seasonal preferences. They just pick a little home, nothing fancy, and they're in your, their own little utopia anyway, you know. Slight digression, but I thought it might be valuable. Is there any advice that I have for you at the end of this whole thing? Well, don't take legislation of AI uh, lightly at all. In terms of your family and trying to make sure that they don't want a, a, an alternate reality to be their primary reality, 
Well, there's a way to kind of juice the old pump on that one, which is to take your family out to your local area, whatever it is, and do things, right? Take your grandson out, your granddaughter out, and fish. And man, when those kids pull on that little tiny fish, man, you celebrate that thing like they pulled in a swordfish, man. Make sure they don't fall out of love with reality. Where I live, again, kids don't play video games. They skateboard. They surf. What's really awesome is when I go up PCH to go to breakfast or whatever, I see boys and girls, women and men, carrying their surfboards across the one. And they're jaywalking across. Some of them got little tiny surfboards. Some of them got long boards. They're carrying that thing a quarter mile back to their home, back to their car, whatever it is. They labor to get in that ocean and ride a wave. But I remember living in Kansas and being pretty landlocked, you know. But we hunted and we fished and we built things with our hands and we helped old ladies, you know. It was like there was always something that was rewarding. Mowing a lawn could be very rewarding, you know. Don't let those things become unpopular, even in your own life. If you haven't done some of those things, we'll do some of those things. Or if nothing else, go hang out with people that do those things. And at least you'll, you'll feel uh, like a kindred soul. You'll be like, I don't, need, I don't have any talent to do that, but I like watching you do it. Now, at least I'm outside and I'm talking to you and I can ask you a hundred questions. What's it like to do this? Well, what about this and that? It'll reduce your humanity. What happened in the 60s? Kids who were stuck in the burbs, they dressed like, you know, you know, wilderness people and went out and did communes and, and rediscovered nature, right? That's where you get the flower power thing, right? At that point, America was pretty straight. A lot of corruption, but there's enough straight politicians and folks in the world that they went to end that flower power thing because kids weren't going to work. And they were atrophying their brains. Now, luckily, LSD got a lot of people to create some amazing movies and special effects and technologies because their brains had been utterly expanded forever, like they put the machine on from the krill. They were brain boosted. That was a very fortunate outcome for those folks. But they got into arts and crafts and all kinds of wild stuff. Stuff that was ubiquitous to America 100 years earlier. Well, I don't know. Maybe we figure out a way to pull that whole thing back into uh, fruition. We we start uh, eh, not necessarily demonizing, but you know, saying, "Oh, you're you're on the computer. Oh, I'm really sorry. Oh, I see you on your phone. I'm really sorry about that." You know, isn't that isn't that horrible that we go to dinner and you're in your phone the whole time that we're talking? And if I say anything that's not related to what you saw on your phone today, well, I'm passe or something. When all the crap you're looking at on your phone is complete junk, it has no value to your whole life, it doesn't do anything for your entire life, right? We got to be careful moving forward. That's my caution. Remember, societies didn't used to change as fast as they're changing now. They change on a dime. I mean, you know, what was it? Uh, the Pokemon game. We shouldn't have phenomenons like that where kids are walking in the middle of a street to chase a Pokemon while a car hits them. You know, I mean, it's like because it's a trend. All these TikTok challenges where kids are dead by the hundreds across the world. Thousands of kids no longer exist today because TikTok said, oh, you should try to shove like uh, five tablespoons of cinnamon in your mouth. See if you can stab yourself in the throat and live. You know, I mean, just like, okay, you know, it's like, that's how brilliant children are today. It's not going to self-correct. We're going to have to participate. I know if you're listening to me, you are ready to go. If it's your first time listening to me, welcome to the game. I think the goal of man is to be left alone. Do no harm. That's your law. You don't do anything bad to any other people. I don't care how subatomic that bad thing is. You don't do anything bad to somebody else. It's just that simple. You can't control all your thoughts. But let that be the playground where you, where you realize, you know, what work you got to do with yourself. But in terms of externalizing those thoughts into actions, make sure you only pick from the good side. And you'll be so happy when you're in your deathbed, 
floating away from your little body, going to a whole nother cosmology, be like, ah, now I get it. Now all that sacrifice where I saw friends of mine break the law and get ahead, supposedly, I didn't do any of that crap, and now I'm going to get ahead in a way that is way more eternal and valuable. Anyway, I hope you did get dug the episode. This stuff just rattles in my brain all day long. Hopefully it rattles in yours as well. I'm looking forward to some good comments. Comments have been a little bit light. I want to say something about the YouTube channel. They have done a miraculous thing to the YouTube channel. It's at 54.85, but... Um, I'm going to say this a couple times, you know, the idea that somehow we don't have subscribers all of a sudden, we are now for the first time, probably in the history of the channel, and you know, I take responsibility for creating content people may not like, but I look at the metrics of how a, a video is accepted, right? We've had record-breaking episodes in the last six months, meaning the the literally the curve of People who are interested in episode has been record breaking, and I think that they're starting to prepare for maybe some stuff happening in 2024, silencing in an algorithmic way, a little bit better than canceling the channel, of course. Of course, we're playing a different game nowadays with Rumble and BitChute to hold the heavier content. So if you haven't subscribed, do hit the subscription button. And hey, man, if you never come back, no big deal. But it, you know, if I could actually figure out a way to get you know, a thousand people to subscribe, we would see their algorithm go nuts. Not to get the subscriptions for my ego or any of that crap, but to just see if we literally had a, a Chinese firm that goes, okay, I got 10,000 cell phones sitting on uh, bookshelves. Watch this. Bang. And all of a sudden it went, brrr, they would freak out. They would probably find videos they didn't like and try to cancel the channel. They're playing a game right now that's nuts. So, if you have the ability to get more devices, more accounts to subscribe, let's try to break this thing a little bit because I'm going to be watching to see how they react to it more than anything else in the entire world. A thousand ain't going to change my game at all, right? It's not going to make me more popular with anybody else out there. And it's not going to lift the shadow banning whatsoever. We do have a date, I think November of this year, where they're going to lift the one strike they put on the channel when that occurs, I can apply again for monetization. Not that I need the money or anything like that, but that also releases the shadow ban because as soon as they can serve an ad, they push to, push to the content to burn ads, right? And so it'll be very interesting to see. We have a lot of information for folks out there. And again, just refer a friend. Again, the I haven't said this in a long time, but if you want to refer someone to this, Look through the episodes to find one that strategically would appeal to your friend. Figure out what they're interested in. If they mention a conspiracy, just go to the website, deepthoughtsradio.com, which has got a brand new DreamHost server, which is super fast compared to the throttled GoDaddy. Hopefully DreamHost doesn't throttle. But give them Bermuda Triangle. Give them the Titanic, you know. But just let them know that, you know, the older episodes are in black and white. And they can be a little rough. But let them know, too, there's pictures the Titanic episode's got tons of pictures. So does Bermuda. It's only cerebral runs. We can look at my ugly face the whole time. Anyway, thanks for showing up. Thanks for continuing to subscribe to the Patreon PayPal folks. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Remember, the channel has, uh, the website has everything on it. The podcast, all the other sources. There are chaos reports on Rumble and BitChute. And uh, the podcast as well. And again, we have 4.7 on iTunes, so that's good. It's amazing how it happens. It's because they don't host the content. But anyway, take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.